tiny plane high above the Milford Sound in New Zealand. I'm Tim Desher, and this is Heritage Explains. I really needed to get away. Seriously, when you work in D.C., there comes a point when you say to yourself, just get me out of this swamp. So where do you go? For me, I go as far away as I can get. That's why in the past four years, I've been to New Zealand three times. You can't get any further away before you start coming back. But it's not just the distance. It's the tradition and excitement of seeing a rugby match. If you don't know, that's the New Zealand national rugby team called the All Blacks. Before each game, they do a ceremonial dance or challenge called the Haka. I'll link to it in our show notes if you haven't seen it before. But what about the scenery? In the background, you can hear Queenstown, New Zealand. It's a scenic town surrounded by snowy, jagged peaks and water that is the clearest turquoise and blue that you've ever seen. Just Google photos of it. On any given day, you can close your eyes and hear a waterfall, or runners running through a park, or people laughing over a local brew. Or how about someone sitting by a lake playing a hang tank drum? This all helps make up the soundtrack for New Zealand. In fact, it's a place that I go to in my mind when I need to escape from everyday life. But it's not just because it has beautiful scenery, wonderful people with cool accents, and great food, although these are major positives. It's special because it's one of the few places in this world that actually has a good handle on government and a firm grasp on their identity as a nation and as a friend and ally to the United States. America's political culture is very different to New Zealand, I would say. In New Zealand, the the greatest virtue a politician can display is listening to the people. Um, In practice, that often means listening to the median voter. That's Louis Holbrook. He works at the New Zealand Taxpayers Union. They engage with and mobilize voters through grassroots campaigns to stand against wasteful spending, high taxes, and promote government transparency. When we met last week, he shared about perceived differences, but also similarities between Americans and New Zealanders, or as they're also affectionately called, Kiwis. We're actually sometimes a bit jealous of the American culture where you see politicians stand on values, uh, on principles, and on backbone. Uh, that You get these spirited debates, um, both in, uh, in politics but also in the grassroots in the states, that we don't necessarily have in New Zealand. Uh, we're quite jealous of the way that uh, Americans can so easily mobilise that sense of values and emotion and turn that into action. Uh, we have to work in slightly different ways because of that. Did you know New Zealand was ranked number three in the 2019 Index of Economic Freedom, while America is ranked 12th? Why? What are the differences in policy decisions by our respective governments? What are the different drivers for policy decisions between Kiwis and Americans? Eric Crampton is the chief economist at the New Zealand Initiative. They're a research group in the capital city of Wellington, representing the interests of New Zealand business through sound fiscal policy and individual liberty. This week, he explains. Eric, thank you so much for being uh, with... Actually, thank you for hosting me here in New Zealand. No problem at all. <laughs> this is a, It's a rainy, cloudy day right now. Uh, we are downtown Wellington, New Zealand, and uh, Eric has graciously given me uh, his office for the next 15 to 20 minutes. So, Eric, again, thank you so much. No problem. You are ranked 
the third freest economy in the world right now behind yep. Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, and we base that on several factors, including tax and rule of law and trade and labor. Um, and, and the reason why it's so, uh, I was so excited about talking to you is because you have a report that I think should be a report that every free market thinking organization should produce for wherever they're at. And it's called The Outside of the Asylum, A New Zealander's Guide to the World Out There. And it's a treatise screaming out to Kiwis, and we call uh, New Zealanders Kiwis, right? Yep. Okay. About how good they have it um, compared to the rest of the world. It's optimistic. It's funny. I'm going to link to it. Everybody, you have to read this. It's fantastic. So just tell me, what was the impetus for writing this? It, it comes back to the reasons that I moved here in the first place, and you highlighted some of them around our economic freedom, but we also combine that with really strong civil liberties. So Heritage's ranking on economic freedom is awesome. New Zealand sticks with that. We do similarly well in the Fraser Institute Index. But if you look at some of the emerging ones that have come out on civil liberties, New Zealand does very well on those indices as well. And I don't think that there's anywhere in the world that can beat us simultaneously on civil liberties, like the basic personal freedoms that really matter too, as well as economic freedom. So the countries that'll beat us in economic freedom, like Singapore and Hong Kong, well, they're a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to raise my kids there. Um, <laughs> New Zealand has just the best bundle of these. And it, the contrast when I when I moved from uh, America to New Zealand was just striking. So I went to grad school at George Mason uh, in economics. It's one of the more f free market oriented places. You learn a lot about the importance of markets and how they work. As I got onto the plane, it, heading out to the to Dulles Airport, um, you got the, the head, this was just after 9-11 when I was coming out for my job interviews at the University of Canterbury, and you had the guys with the machine guns on top of the Humvees and the security and police with the machine guns in the airports, and that was kind of uncomfortable. Um, you get to New Zealand, and there's basically no airport security. It's amazing. And the you just walk onto the plane. You're right. Um, the, the it's tightened up a little bit, and it's especially tightened up for people who want to fly to the states because America requires that you import a little bit of the asylum. But land in New Zealand, and you start doing things that you'd need to be signing a million waivers for in the states, right? So yeah, talk about sure, this is this so is funny. Great. This I, I love this. Uh, you, you, and, and by asylum, you basically mean an insane asylum. Oh yeah, um, the rest of the world being the insane asylum, and, and here being a, a breath yep. of fresh air. And so, we, in in the piece or in the report, you talk about uh, this national park here. This is like this is so great. You got to yeah. tell this. Yeah. So. Um, I, I call it the outside of the asylum because it, if we look back at the old Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, there was a guy who decided that the world had gone crazy when he saw the instructions on a packet of toothpicks. So he built a wall around his property on, on the beachfront, decorated the outside of the wall for the benefit of the inmates of the asylum, and put a big sign above the door saying, welcome to the outside of the asylum. And I think we should have that sign at the arrivals lounge in every New Zealand airport. Welcome to the outside of the asylum. So get to New Zealand and the economics department, they're trying to hire me or we're feeling each other out about a job and they're trying to make the best pitch. And some of it, they're just taking for granted and they're not noticing that this is something that'd be really striking for somebody who cares about the freedom to do things and be able, well, living free, right? So the head of department takes me for a drive up in the Port Hills of Christchurch, these crazy roads that would be barricaded off in the States because there's sheep walking across them and sheer drops off the side. But it's just a matter of course here. Probably no guardrails. Oh, yeah. There were no guardrails. Um, <laughs> but then he takes me out to Cave Stream. So there's this park up towards Arthur's Pass where there's a river that's run its way through this limestone. And you start at the base where the water's coming out and you start in water that's about up to your neck and it's pretty cold. You just wear your swim togs and it's all fine. Uh, then, then you walk up through it and the sign at the parking lot, I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't remember it exactly, but what it said was there are no lights in the cave. It's dark. The water's cold. If you go through in winter without appropriate clothing, you're going to die of hypothermia. Have fun. <laughs> right. And it, I just love the spirit of that. Right. Right. Inform people about the risks, but let them be free to do what they want. And that, that sold me on the place. I wanted to live the rest of my life here. And just taking a quick step aside from my conversation with Eric, I wanted to just give a little plug for the Daily Signal podcast. 
It's an aggregation of some of the best, most hard-hitting news of the day that conservatives should be interested in. And they do it in a really, really convenient quick way. Right up top, they give you the headlines that you need, and then they work their way into more in-depth interviews that help put context to the news of the day. Log on and check out the Daily Signal podcast. It really is worth the download, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on it. All right, back to my conversation with Eric. One of the things that we focus on quite a bit, and we've actually hosted um, an entire uh, event at the Heritage Foundation on this entire thing, and I want you to talk about it a little bit because our listeners would be fascinated. Uh, Part of the reforms back in the 80s included some pretty intense um, liberalization or opening um, of the agricultural market here in New Zealand. Talk more about what happened with that and what the result has been. Well, the result has been fantastic, but we'll get to the root, the root to it. So the 80s reforms came out of some, well, terrifying economic times. New Zealand had lost preferential access to the UK market. We'd had a deal there as part of the Commonwealth that we had a lot of exports that were tariff-free when the UK joined the European community. We lost access to that. That started some economic decline here. And then that really ramped up under Prime Minister Muldoon, where you had just insane spending policies and a fiscal crisis. The incoming Labour government in 1984, and again, this was a Labour government, so they're beholden to the unions, and, well, you, you know what? They're, yeah, they're not conservative. They're cons- <laughs> definitely not conservative. But they saw the books, they saw the magnitude of the crisis, and they knew that we had to fix things. They had some exceptionally competent people at Treasury who had been thinking about what needed to be done and had been talking with Sir Roger Douglas, who was the, uh, he wasn't Sir at the time, but he was the finance minister, about what was going to be needed to be done. And one way I like to think about it is if everybody's standing in a circle with their hands in the guy in the back pocket of the guy in front of them, fondling the next guy's wallet. Nobody wants to be the first one to pull the hand out of the pocket, right? It's a visual. Right? Uh, But if everybody agrees to do it at the same time, you can have wonderful things happen. And that's basically what happened here in the 80s and 90s. So... The agricultural subsidies were completely unsustainable. There was no way the government could afford to keep paying people to farm mutton that nobody wanted. And so they just did away with all of it. And the farmer said, that's great. Let's do that. And actually, even before the 80s reforms, the farmers went to Robert Muldoon and said, can you please get rid of the subsidies because they're distortionary and they're making a mess of things, but get rid of the tariffs on importing a lot of agricultural machinery at the same time. And Muldoon told them to go away, that he understood farming better than they did. Okay, so we get the 80, the 84 government comes in. We get rid of all of these tariffs. Now, there were some really hard times for a lot of farmers in the short term. Um, folks had geared up entirely to run their operation in accordance with a pile of perverse incentives created by subsidies. And they had to restructure, and that was hard for a lot of places. We had a lot of meatworks plants that would shut down and a lot of unemployment because of that. Hmm. So we had a pile of rules that propped up really small-scale meatworks in a pile of small towns, and that all went away. Uh, Everything consolidated. But you find out the things that you were missing because of the subsidies, once the subsidies are gone. So agricultural production shifted from mutton that people didn't want to eat to spring lamb. Wow. It tastes a lot better. We'd been raising mutton on some of the best wine-growing country in the whole damn world, right? Hmm. And It's impressive, yeah. And like the gimblet gravels. Is, that stopped being really poor quality sheep paddock because it's an old riverbed, it's stony, and it starts being some of the best best wine country in the world, Hmm. okay? So you start realizing these opportunities when people start looking at profit opportunities and what the market wants and what consumers want to pay money for rather than for what the government wants to spend money on. And agriculture here is thriving. What are some of your biggest challenges or maybe some of your biggest competition as an organization in the the in the ring of ideas you're battling for ideas right now so what would you say would be some of your biggest um, competition or challenges well inertia is the biggest competition always that there's a giant morass in wellington that is resistant to change and some change does need to happen so not everything here is perfect uh most 
most importantly, uh, housing is a giant mess. We have set rules around land use here that are as bad as anything in San Francisco and have resulted in house prices that are as bad as San Francisco So, relative to incomes. Now, it'll still look cheap if you're coming in on... Um, an American income or having sold out in a place like San Francisco. But if you take a multiple relative to median incomes, we're as unaffordable as anywhere. Now that comes out of... It's trade yeah. and housing in the opinion pages. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it yep. is. <laughs> so anyway, it's good that yeah. you're covering this. Continue. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we've had this interconnected mess of regulations and poor incentives facing local councils or even perverse incentives where growth is a cost for them rather than a benefit. So, of course, you end up getting some zoning decisions that make it really hard for cities to expand. So we've been pushing on that front on trying to change the institutional structures around that and the incentives so that councils will want to welcome growth rather than hinder it. Talk a little bit about... um what you would like to see from a U.S.-New Zealand relationship um, in the next, we'll say, four years? I would love to see America taking the Pacific a little bit more seriously. Um, America has retrenched, and some of the retrenching is important, that America doesn't really need to have bases all over the world and as much of the adventurism as it has had. But it does need to be economically interlinked with the rest of the world. And good trade agreements are an important part of that. It just seems so bizarre to me that New Zealand has a free trade agreement with China, but not one with the United States. And it's great that New Zealand has a free trade agreement with China. Our dairy exports to China went through the roof when uh, when we were able to achieve that. But we need to have um, strength in multilateral institutions. We need to have America an important part, again, of the World Trading Organization and allowing appointments to the disputes resolution tribunals that help the whole system to work and being willing to engage in multilateral trade agreements rather than going for more of the hub-and-spoke model that seems to have been the current preference where um, America would have one-on-one trade agreements with each of several countries, but all of that makes everything more difficult in an interconnected world where you've got supply chains that go across multiple countries. And if you have a whole series of one-off agreements, it gets really difficult for those to properly incorporate all of the other agreements to enable the kind of dynamic um interconnected world that we should be in and that America should be helping to lead where you can have parts of the supply chain all over the world, but then everybody's got a stake in the whole system standing up, right? And we see that as being fundamentally at risk. Eric, this has been a, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. And um, I look forward to continuing to stay in touch the next time that I'm in New Zealand. <laughs> well, we'd love to have you here more often. And that's it for today's episode of Heritage Explains. If you have a cool story about your travels to New Zealand, I would love to hear them. Go ahead and send an email to managingeditor at heritage.org or leave us a comment on whatever format you listen to this podcast on. Eric's report on New Zealand is uplifting, hilarious, and full of great information. So please check it out. Also, as mentioned in the episode... I'm going to link to the All Blacks Haka, so please go check that out. You won't regret it. Michelle's up next week with a brand new episode, and we look forward to seeing you then. Heritage Explains is produced by Michelle Cordero and Tim Desher, with editing by Thalia Rampersad.